This video was made possible by Brilliant. More on them later. In 2020, it was estimated that at least one tonne in six of global carbon emissions came from transport. Road vehicles, ships, planes and trains. In order to prevent significant disruption to our planet, we must bring global carbon emissions down to zero, which means we need to decarbonize the transport sector. Which means buy an electric car and don't fly, right? Well, yes, and also no. This is a very complicated problem with a very complicated solution that will vary depending on where you live and how wealthy you are. This video isn't going to be a detailed package of solutions, but instead an overview of how the International Transport Forum, or ITF, a respected multinational research group, has proposed and modelled how the world can cut its transport emissions by the year 2050. There are two kinds of transport, moving people and moving freight. These produce approximately equal carbon emissions. However, as well as considering the two different types of transport, it's also helpful to consider three different distance scales travelled. Urban, moving around within a city. Intercity, moving between cities or within rural areas. And international, moving between countries and moving between continents. Let's go through how to decarbonize those three scales, starting with urban transport. Right now, two out of every three journeys made around the world are made within cities, and because these are short journeys, they contribute about a third of all passenger emissions. Depending on how far you're traveling within a city, you might walk or cycle, take public transport, drive your own vehicle, or rideshare. What you choose to do will depend on any number of factors and will vary wildly by city. Therefore, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to decarbonizing city-wide transport. Each city will be different. But here's what will be universal. This century, more and more people will live in cities. And so, as cities grow, it is important to keep services nearby and keep journeys as short as possible. In other words, we want to avoid urban sprawl, low-density neighborhoods that you have to travel out of to do, well, anything. The first step? City planners should keep cities dense as they grow, allowing more journeys to be taken on foot or by bike or electric bike, and should build infrastructure to allow this. However, you're still going to want to travel across the city sometimes, and while cycle lanes will make journeys of a few kilometers more attractive, they're not always going to be practical. And so we come to the second step. Invest in public transport. In many places, public transport, meaning buses, trams, metro, light rail, is seen as a service taken when there is no alternative. Making buses and trams an attractive, high-quality service will encourage their use, and combined with electrification have many benefits, including reduced congestion, better air quality, and, of course, lower carbon emissions. All of this accomplished because it will make people less likely to drive their own vehicle. Cars are realistically going to be part of urban life this century, though they produce fully one-third of all transport emissions. So step three, we must, indeed, replace internal combustion engine cars with zero-emission vehicles, such as electric cars. This can be accomplished in many ways, initially incentivizing electric car uptake, making them more affordable by, for example, making them exempt from road tax, and then later disincentivize the use of internal combustion engine vehicles, such as through zero emission zones in city centers. This does come with a few problems. It's estimated that most countries have less than half the power output required to support electric vehicle fleets in 2030. New power generation is needed, and of course, Step four, new power generation needs to be low carbon. No point electrifying everything if your electricity supply comes from fossil fuels. But what about freight transport within cities? While you may not think of it, cities are nodes in the global freight network. They are where the majority of goods end up, and as middle classes grow, so too will the transport of freight to and within cities this century. For example, urban freight demand is expected to triple in East and Northeast Asia by 2050. While the electrification of light goods vehicles like vans will be important, as will efficiency savings in systems design, companies sharing delivery vehicles for example, it's expected that significant emission savings can come from step 5, the use of cargo bikes, and particularly electric cargo bikes for last mile deliveries. A trend that's already emerging and will likely become more common, city geography depending, as cities become more dense. 
How much carbon do you emit by moving a person each kilometre by car or train or plane? Well, we have data on that. Specifically, in the UK, we can see that a petrol car has about four times the carbon footprint per kilometre as an electric car, emphasising the importance of transitioning to electric vehicles again, and about five times the footprint of a train. The only thing with a greater footprint per kilometre is taking a flight. This all becomes relevant when talking about intercity travel. How you decarbonise this kind of travel will depend on how far you're travelling and the geography of where you live. If travelling less than 500 kilometres, especially in Europe or South Asia, you are likely to take the train or drive, while if travelling that distance in North America, you are more likely to fly or drive, with trains unlikely to be an option. Just as in cities, cars will remain a fixture of transport at this scale, particularly when travelling in rural areas. So transitioning to zero emission vehicles is even more important and will require step six, government investment in charging infrastructure within communities and on key routes, both for passenger transport and for freight. The ITF writes that decarbonizing road freight has received less attention than passenger transport modes, but the ingredients are now in place for a quiet revolution in low carbon logistics. Especially in developed markets like Europe, electric trucks and other heavy goods vehicles are likely to be as cheap as their petrol and diesel counterparts in the 2030s. To encourage electrification then, which will likely start with lighter vehicles and then scale up to heavy trucks, step seven, policies to encourage and facilitate electric freight, such as tax exemptions, should be put in place. But this leaves the elephant in the room. Cars and buses and trucks can be made electric. Trains are already low carbon and where electrified will only become lower carbon. But what about planes? As the most carbon intense way to travel, there are many people who think flights over short distances should be banned. A ban on flights less than 500 kilometers in length could move nearly 50% of all short haul passengers to rail transport by 2050. However, this only works if there is a rail alternative. So step eight, investment in rail infrastructure, especially high speed rail if connecting high population cities, and especially in Europe, Australia, North America, and East Asia is vital. If you want an example of what's possible here, look at China's incredible high speed rail network, making domestic flights largely unnecessary. But this simply isn't going to be practical everywhere either. In places like the Caribbean, Indonesia or the Philippines, trains aren't going to cut it much of the time, and ferries aren't always practical either. Flying is here to stay, especially when you look at international travel. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying that yes, there are many places where international travel is easy by train, Europe especially. But look at the modes of transport used when traveling over 3000 kilometers, a distance typically traveled between countries. It's dominated by aircraft. The ITF modeled how this distribution of passenger kilometers might change by 2050. This is what it looks like with current transport policies. And this is what it looks like with really ambitious policies. There simply isn't an alternative to flying when transporting passengers very long distances. So what do we do about aviation? How do we bring its emissions, a little over 10% of total transport emissions, down? Well, the first solution is step nine, make some long distance trips unnecessary. As the pandemic demonstrated, much of what we would previously take a plane to accomplish can now be done by video call. Between teleworking and raising awareness of the environmental impact of flying, we can reduce the total number of passenger kilometers traveled by air by the current population. Of course, as the global middle class increases in size this century, so too will the demand for flying. As such, both the ITF and the aviation industry see two ways they can slash the emissions of flying. Firstly, step 10, improve the fuel efficiency of planes. By some admittedly optimistic accounts by the ITF, improvements including changes to wing design, reductions in taxi time, and more efficient engine design could see fuel use per kilometer flown decrease by 57% though I'll believe that when I see it. Secondly though, step 11, use alternative fuels. 
Currently, planes overwhelmingly burn kerosene in their engines. The aviation industry expects most of their emission cuts to come from Sustainable Aviation Fuels, or SAFs. These are fuels that, instead of being made of oil pumped from the ground, are produced from biomass, or synthetically through hydrogen and captured carbon. If such fuels could be made, they could be used in existing infrastructure and existing planes, making their adoption very easy. However, to say that these fuels are in the early stages of development would be generous. Whether bio- or electro-fuels could be made at scale and made with a sufficiently low carbon footprint, either through land use or electricity, is simply unknown. Electric planes may be applicable to some very short distance routes, but based on current technology, no more than that. Hydrogen could be used as a fuel source, but this is also in the early stages of development and would require additional infrastructure. Even in the ITF's ambitious policy framework, hydrogen isn't a factor until the late 2040s. Aviation then remains stubbornly difficult to decarbonize. SAFs are unsurprisingly the industry's hope and, while underdeveloped, could be considered the most realistic of an unrealistic bunch of solutions. Flying is here to stay, but for the time being the best we can do is not do it where possible. International freight is a similar story. It's dominated not by planes, but by ships. If you're moving something other than a passenger between continents, you almost always do it by sea. And by 2050, we currently expect a 95% increase in international freight. Similar to aviation, this simply isn't going to change anytime soon. There is no practical alternative to shipping. So instead of reinventing the wheel, step 12, improve the fuel efficiency of ships through retrofitting existing vessels and improving the designs of new ships. Complicated by the fact that ships tend to be in service for over 25 years, again, optimistic estimates suggest efficiency improvements of 55% are possible through installing ducktails, reducing operational speed, and improved maintenance schedules. Additionally, this may sound familiar, step 13, use alternative shipping fuels. This could partly mean wind power, but realistically, it means similar fuels to those proposed in aviation, with all the associated problems. But there is one final strategy that is applicable to both aviation and shipping, and the ITF recommends for decarbonisation at every distance scale, and that is step 14, carbon pricing. This is the idea that if you buy a product or use a service that causes the emission of carbon, you pay an extra charge proportional to the amount of carbon emitted. The theory goes that consumers will prefer to use services with lower carbon footprints to lower how much they pay, and so businesses are economically encouraged to reduce their emissions. In a transport context, it would, for example, incentivize airlines to switch to less emitting fuels to remain cost competitive with alternatives like rail. It would also accelerate the uptake of electric road vehicles. Exactly how this carbon pricing would be enacted, by whom, and at what price should be set per tonne of carbon is up for debate. As is how to avoid it unfairly impacting low-income consumers. As is whether or not it would actually ever work when enacted by governments. But. In the ITF's opinion, along with suspending tax breaks for shipping and aviation, carbon pricing is an effective tool to decarbonise transport, especially stubbornly difficult to decarbonise long distance transport. In the absence of better options, this may prove decisive. And where would the money generated by this carbon pricing go? Well, it could go to governments to pay for steps 1 to 13 in decarbonising transport. It's almost like the ITF thought of this. Clearly, this is a complex problem. As the distance travelled increases, it gets harder and harder to reduce emissions. But strategies exist at every distance scale, and for passengers and for freight. Together, we think they're enough. The International Transport Forum modelled steps 1 to 14 in a high ambition policy scenario, and estimated that even considering growing population demand and associated social changes, transport emissions can be cut to around one quarter of current levels by the year 2050. More emissions cuts than even the 1.5 degrees target of the IPCC requires. We have the ideas, and much of the technology. Now, governments must be bold plan into the future, invest in the tech, decide on a course of action and provide the solutions. 
It doesn't need to happen all at once. Even the highly ambitious modelling assumed that policy would change slowly over decades. But it does need to happen. Step 15 in decarbonising transport is starting now. Something else you can start now is using your phone to improve your understanding of the world around you, learning about statistics or physics or computer science. You can do so with Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant.org is an educational app and website designed to help students and young professionals reach their goals in maths, science and computer science. Whether you're a STEM student looking for a fun way to supplement their learning in the classroom, or simply someone who wants to keep their mind active and learning new things, Brilliant has courses and guided learning paths for you. Their thousands of lessons, ranging from foundational to graduate level, are interactive, beautifully illustrated, and cover topics ranging from geometry to vector calculus, gears to relativity. If you found this video interesting, you'll enjoy their series of lessons on infrastructure, including the physics of aeroplanes and modelling traffic jams as fluid flows. This isn't an app that makes you memorise answers. Through bite-sized lessons, it actually helps you understand the topics and improves your intuition and problem-solving techniques. If I was in school right now, I would absolutely be using Brilliant to support my learning in maths classes. To get started today, head to brilliant.org slash simonclark, linked in the description, and get a 30-day free trial. The first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off a premium annual subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark to supercharge the way you look at the world. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for continuing to be, well, brilliant. As already mentioned, this video is overwhelmingly based on the International Transport Forum's 2023 report, with some information from the 2022 report and from Drawdown, edited by Paul Hawken. Links to all those are in the description. I'd recommend you give them a read for detailed sets of proposals to enact the changes described in this video. This video also wouldn't have been possible without the support of two groups of people. First of all, Andy. Sam and Ferox for their assistance in capturing game footage. Frankly, I think it was any excuse to play OpenTTD. And secondly, my patrons. These lovely people are my executive producers and have a say in one video topic a month. If you would like to support my work, get exclusive behind the scenes vlogs and have a say in what videos I make, consider supporting me on my Patreon. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to watch something else, please check out the videos on the screen right now, and I'll see you in the next one.